Uh, hello everyone, uh, welcome to this cohort of the ISLP book. Uh, today we're going to be working with the exercises, well, the only the applied ones of the ISLP chapter number four, uh, and that is going to be classification using Python. Uh, so it's actually only, I think, three exercises. Uh, one of these, it, it really isn't quite related to data analysis, just some basic Python knowledge. So we will be covering the other ones. Uh, and let's begin. Uh, okay, so I'll be loading the the necessary libraries. I think I even didn't use this one, so I'm gonna leave this. So for the, for the first exercise, it says, uh, we'll be working with the weekly data set. It's similar to the to the other one in the in the lab about stocks and how it's changing with time. Uh, sorry, with the smart data set, that's the name. Uh, let's see, it contains 1,089 rows uh, for 21 years in these time periods. Uh, so first, uh, we have to, to produce some summaries of the data. I try to do it with plot nine because I am more familiarized with with Gplot, but I know it, it didn't quite work. So in the end, uh, I will use in C1 uh, to Cardo suggested. So we load the, the data. Uh, as you can see, it's already being cleaned up. Ah, someone joined. Uh, hello, Utam. Hi. Okay. So this is the data set. Uh, as I was saying, it has already been pre-processed. So the data types are, are already the, the correct ones. Um, and also there are some categorical variables. Or I, th I think it's only one. Let me check. Yes, only one. That is the column that we want to predict, the direction column. Um, if we remember from what we saw in the last chapter, well, in the last meeting, uh, sometimes when deciding to use uh, LDA or QDA, instead of using logistic regression, it has to do if if the behavior of the of the predictors is it mostly the same for each class, or are there classes where the predictors behave quite different compared to another class? So that's what I'm doing over here. We compare for direction up and direction down. Uh, just a summary of the numerical predictors. As we can see uh, over here, let's see, maybe for, for left for left two, maybe the mean is like minus 0 0.04. And for the other class, it's actually with the other sign. And so and so we can compare other statistics. Uh, for other columns as well, but even with only this, like, only with only this, this summary, we we will get a sense that there is some difference, um, for the central tendencies of the predictors if we inspect them class by class. So, uh, and one other important part because we will be working with logistic regression and that is a type of generalized model, uh, the same assumptions or, or conditions, maybe it's a better way, a better way to put it, like Ricardo, Ricardo mentioned in the linear regression chapter about a, no, about the, for example, about the absence of autocollinearity of the predictors. We, we, also, need, we also need those assumptions for us for the logistic regression model to work. So in that, in that sense, we can just perform a, a heat map of the correlation matrix of these numerical variables in the data sets. And as we can see, their correlation seems to be pretty low in, in size, well, in absolute value. So in that sense, it seems fine for the most part. Okay, so now with the graphical summaries, we can perform a simple histogram of the numerical variables and a bar plot for the categorical ones. As we can see over here, um, something that we can see is that there almost seems to be 
perhaps not a, a specific normal uh, distribution for the lag uh, columns, but at least there is some symmetry. Maybe there is some transformation that we can perform to them, to those columns, so that they indeed resemble a Gaussian distribution. Uh, well, for the volume, no, sir. Is it volume? I think this. Uh, volume and today, let's see. For, uh, for today, there is a, there seems to be also a Gaussian distribution, but for volume, not at all. And the years uh, seem to be quite uniformly distributed. Uh, so something like we, something that we can do is that we have numerical and categorical variables. So, for example, what do we want to predict? Well, the direction. So we can perform a, a scatter plot of the numerical variables but also coloring with respect to, to the response variable, this reaction variable, and also show them by year. So how is it evolving? So that's what I'm doing over here. I, I, it's probably going to take a while. I don't know why uh, it's so cumbersome. We really only need to do this line over here in order to generate the code, but uh, I wanted to shift the orientation of the year because it says like 1,090, I don't know, 20. And next to another big number, eh, they overlap, so it will look pretty bad. So it, there seems to be, uh, uh, I think it was a bug or something for Seabron eh, that make, made it trickier than it should be in order to fix that rotation of the labels. And you need it to be something like this. So, well, it should, uh, it's okay, it's over here. Okay, for example, for, for this variable, sorry, for this plot, we have right in the x axis, the years, how it is evolving over time, and in the y axis today, that variable. And as you can see, this uh, uh, split of the, of the data at the threshold today equal to zero. Uh, it's a perfect separation of direction down and up, and that's probably because that's how it was defined. So, uh, in that sense, this today variable, uh, maybe it's not as useful as the other ones because uh, we already know from today the exact value of direction, if it is down or up. So, we need to use the other predictors, in particular, these lag predictors. And as we can see, there doesn't seem to be a quite a quite uh, like obvious pattern that makes us uh, be able to predict if the duration is down or up. Uh, maybe there's one that what it does. No, not really. In one of, one of the next exercises, uh, this type of scatter plots do indicate you uh, which are the most significant variables that you need for your model. But in this case, it doesn't seem to be the case. So let's go to the next item. Ah, also, sorry, if you have any question, feel free to interrupt me at any time. I don't mind. So let's now, using this data set, we're going to use all of it. So there is still no uh, split between test and training or, or validation even. So we're going to be using the full data set and perform logistic regression using the predictors, volume, and these five lag variables in order to predict the direction. If it, it is down or is it up? Uh, then from the, from the model that we get, uh, do we know if any of the predictors are there significant? Uh, if so, well, which ones of them? So uh, let's see, item B. Uh, as the code showed, we only need volume and the lags predictors, except for the direction. These are the variables that we want to use. And uh, let's see, we need to do this at least in Python because, well, I'm not sure why. It is, I think because it's trying to emulate the way that you use this uh, generalized linear model. No. Yes, general linear model uh, for R. Uh, but in that sense, we simply define the predictors 
uh, we clarify the response and we fit our model using heuristic regression. So this would be the summary of the results. There is some coefficient, uh, in particular over here for these probabilities. Uh, we, we would expect that a value, for example, ah, wait, there is a comment. Ah, yes, thank you, Ricardo. Uh, as I was mentioning, for this column about probability uh, greater than the absolute value of theta, uh, we would expect a value of 0 0.05 or smaller to represent a significant predictor. And as we can see, only this one, this lag two predictor, uh, uh, has that condition. For the other ones, we don't have enough evidence to to say that those predictors are significant uh, for determining the direction. And uh, also, there is some interpretation. Uh, Lucio. Yes, hi, Ricardo. Uh, so, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, if you go back to that cell, uh, in, instead of summarize, did you try summary? Uh, let's see. Instead, in, instead of summarize, the results? Right. I think it's not defined, maybe, or maybe I haven't uh, imported it because I think that's how you do it in R, right? Right. Uh, put there instead of results a uh, GLM. Okay. The model. Yeah. But I don't have the summary function, so we import it. In the lab. Okay, let me check what I have here. Uh, let me check. Wait a minute. Right. Because I, I think I use the summary function. Let me see. Let me check the exercises in the in a regression. Uh, just continue. I'll try to. Okay, I, I know what happened. Okay, uh, just type GLM. Uh, GLM in a, in a new cell, yeah. Okay. Uh, GLM dot summary um, parentheses. Uh, so. Okay, in, there you go. Results and summary. There you go. Yeah, in the <laughs> book, it seems that. In this chapter, they cover that. I think ah, chapter three, sorry. Right. Yeah, uh, yeah because you get the whole, you know, the uh, whole diagnosis of the model. Yeah, interesting. Thank you. I will, I'm going to change this. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. <laughs> uh, and let's see what is other. Uh, for example, over here, G squared. Uh, let's see. Well, I don't get most of them. Uh, and we do get the same table as before, uh, with a little bit more over here. I believe it's uh, exactly. But, but you get also the the diagnostics on the you know on the uh, degrees of freedom, uh, log likelihood, etc., yeah. which is important for this model. Yeah. Sorry, uh, give me one minute. I need to attend yeah. something in my house. I'll be back. Okay. Okay.
Okay, sorry, you're wrong. I'm back. I'm tired. Okay. So let's see. Item C. Ah. Okay. A computer confusion matrix, another real fraction of correct predictions. And also analyze the mistakes performed by the easy regression. And so let's see. The easy regression gives us the probabilities, not the classes, sorry, the predicted probabilities of belonging of belonging to a class. So we get that data from these results variable. And then we can specify a threshold. In particular, this threshold of 0 0.5. Uh, <coughs> sorry, I'm tired. Uh, it maximizes the overall accuracy of the model. So when we do this, we print uh, both the confusion matrix. And what is the accuracy of this model in particular? We get the accuracy of 55, so 56%. And we can see over here, uh, we are trying to predict the value up that is a success of this uh, model for the category. So this would be the true positives. This would be the false positives. So for example, we get that the number of false positives is actually pretty close to the number of true positives. So it depends if one wants to uh, well, sorry, because one has to balance these numbers, these uh, false positives and false negatives. Uh, sometimes one can, someone, sometimes one doesn't mind having many false negatives or many false positives. There is also a, a kind of, of trade-off between this. But in, in, in this particular case, there seems to be quite a lot of false positives with respect to the true positives. I, I, don't, I don't remember the name of this a specific proportion. I think it was a specificity or something. Uh, and also similar happens over here. This uh, false, false negatives is actually also pretty close to this one. So in that sense, uh, this model, because we're only trying to predict a binary response, <coughs> and still it's only giving us 56%, it's, it's not it's not quite better than simply throwing a coin, well, a fair coin, and predicting and predicting based on that result. So in that sense, uh, it's not a good model still. Okay, now it says, uh, instead of using all of the data for building a model, uh, we're going to split it into training and testing. Uh, Let's see. Ah, and the split is going to be performed using this particular fact. Uh, only using lat two, this variable that we saw that had a had a significant uh, value as a good predictor, and focusing also only in this period where the year is between one thousand nine hundred ninety and two thousand eight. Oh, okay, thank you, Ricardo. He also shared the link. Uh, and let's see. Ah, well, I use this price because uh, they give us this range of the years, uh, but we need to check uh, what are the actual years in the data set. And as we can see, the minimum is indeed <laughs> this number, and the maximum, well, it's over that number. So if we want to get this range, we can use uh, this, this one over here, 2008, so 2009 with a straight inequality. So those are, those are the indices. Then uh, over here, which are the variables for our model? It's only going to be lat2. Uh, we use this to emulate R, I think. And then we uh, perform this operation in order to split our data set. And we fit a model using only the training data. Um, these are going to be the probabilities, sorry, the predicted probabilities of belonging to the app class. Let's see. Okay, already run that. 
Uh, and over here, we're going to be comparing if the probability is greater than 0 0.5, that we're going to sign that as up, as a success. And now we simply compare again with the, with the labels that we, that we had as testing. So if it's down or up, uh, what we get now with this particular model is that the accuracy did increase. Uh, and yeah, the accuracy did increase. Um, and, and also this, well, it also seems to be the case that this proportion of false positives with respect to the total number of positives, it seems to also have decreased. Um, well, and that, I don't know how to interpret it more. Mm. Ah, and now, because we're only using one predictor, we can actually see the, the graph, sorry, the plot of the probabilities uh, that we have predicted using the value of lag2. Lag2 is a numerical variable, so we can do a scatter plot with lag2 in the x-axis, the predicted probabilities in the y-axis, and simply color uh, via the, the observation of the direction of the of that specific data point. Uh, and also all of this using uh, the testing data, not the training data. So, uh, and I'm going to add also a, a horizontal line representing this threshold that we have been using so far for giving the probability assigning the class. So let's see this particular scatter plot. We can see the left two and the probability. Um, even be, even above this threshold, we get some points that they belong to different classes. If the model were perfect, uh, above this threshold, uh, we would on, we would only get points of the same class. So like. Everything above would be true, or, and everything below this horizontal line would be false. But and that, that is not the case. Ah, same you, Ricardo. The name is precision for this particular metric. Yeah, the the metric between the false positives and true positives uh, is precision, and that's the formula. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's see. Now, uh, well, the following is simply repeating the same as the lab, uh, giving your training and testing data, uh, comparing the results with LDA, QDA, um, and the other models that we have been working with in, in their most basic form. So like assuming only one neighbor for K, K and N and assuming a normal distribution for the, for the predictors in nice base. Uh, sorry, I have a call. Uh, one minute, please. I'm sorry. Okay, sorry, I'm, I'm back. So we simply use LDA for this data. Uh, well, this part of code is because when we use this particular line uh, of a stats model, we, at least from, from the looks of it, I think it only adds a, a column for the intercept for the logistic regression model. So uh, if we look at this, X data frame, it should have a column intercept that is full of ones. Uh, and this column, we don't really need it for the other models, LDA, QDA. So we simply have to remove it. And that's why they do it over here. Simply remove that uh, added column for training and testing. Uh, we feed this LDA model and then predict some particular uh, 
classes, not, not the not values, not privileges, but the classes. And let's see what do we get. Uh, also zero point six twenty five. Actually, it's too similar. Maybe. Uh, I perform something in a not correct order. I don't remember if it was the same value. I would expect that it's not. Huh. Okay, if the same happens for QDA, I will get worried. Uh, we are getting the same accuracy as when we did the basic regression. Uh, and let's see, let, let's try it with QDA. It shouldn't be the same. And yeah, it can. It's okay. Does anyone know what, why this happened? This uh, same accuracy for both LDA and logistic regression when you use only one predictor? No one knows. So let's continue. And then they ask us to compute the model with KNN neighbors. So we, we use only one neighbor. Uh, we fit the model. And what accuracy do we get? Actually, 0 0.5. And, and as, I, as I said in the beginning, uh, for this binary case, it's really, sorry, for the binary response case, it's really not quite as useful. Yeah, just throw a coin and decide. It. And lastly, for naive bias, uh, we don't use something to estimate the, the, the density of the predictors. We simply assume normality. Uh, and with that assumption, we get a value, well, not as close to 0 0.5. Sorry, no, not, not, as, not as good as the other ones but still not as close as 0 0.5. So overall, which seems to be the better model? Uh, well, it's important to note that even before deciding which one is the better model, uh, we don't really know if maybe by chance we get, uh, in this case, maybe by chance we got in this case that for logistic regression, we have a bigger accuracy that maybe that for example for nice bias but that maybe for another data set of this sign of this exact population of last uh, volume and such so like a, a different sample uh, if the result would be the same that necessarily a logistic regression gives you the greatest accuracy uh, between these four or five models that we have seen so we don't need to make an assumption that this weekly data set is very representative of its particular population. So in that sense, uh, that indeed would give us indication that independent of any representative sample that you get, for most cases, uh, the ones that give you the greater accuracy represent actually the better model. So like it's not as sensitive to the sample data, but it is something more global or general. So we simply take this assumption and compare the, the accuracy of these models and we get that indeed for, ah, there was a difference over here. Ah, because I forgot to put LDA. Okay. What? Now it's okay. So now we, we do get that both for LDA and logistic regression, uh, the accuracy was maximized between these models under this assumption. And lastly, I, I didn't do this one over here because it's a ton of combinations and I, I didn't bother to, to change it. Uh, I would suspect, uh, let's see, that taking the, the variables more significant. So like not only lag two, but another one that seems enough to be insignificant, uh, could improve of the accuracy of the model. So for example, 
uh, wait there or pretty much. But I don't know, I would try to live with left three or maybe other powers of left two and such and such. Did anyone experiment with this? If someone got some interesting result? Okay, seems to not have been the case. So let's continue with this next exercise. Uh, now we're working with a pretty famous photo. I know, I, I will call it auto, auto data set. And uh, uh, let's first load it before commenting anything else. Uh, as, a, as, a, as it was also the case for the weekly data set, it has already been preprocessed, 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 sorry. So the data types are fine. Uh, I think there are even no missing values and such. So for example, we have, let's see, some numerical variables like displacement, uh, acceleration, weight, and such and such for cars, and also some interior values that then we can also consider like almost categorical. But for now, we'll only let's take them as integers. So like, for example, cylinder, uh, the year, well, the year is also categorical. Well, it's, it's an integer, but also categorical. The origin, and also the name of the, of the type of car that we have. And what we are going to predict is Given this numerical column of MPG, uh, we're going to define another variable that is simply for if this if which particular observations of MPG are above the median value of that same column. We perform this and they ask us to not work with true and false, so not booleans, but zero and one. So this operation it gives us a boolean, so it's a list of is false and truths, and to convert it to zero and ones, we can use this direct directly. The false becomes zero, and true becomes one. Now we can see over here, we have ne this new column. Uh, maybe for more rows, we have a different result. Let's see, over here, we have a one for this particular observation because its MPG is above, above the mean, sorry, the median of the particular column MPG. So for question B, uh, this was quite interesting. Indeed, in this case, uh, we do get uh, quite clear patterns in the pictures. So they ask us to investigate with graphics. What is the association between this response that we have defined and the other predictors in our, sorry, and the predictors in our data set? Uh, which of those seem most significant for predicting MPG? So they ask us to do some scatter plots and box plots. So as I was saying, we can use the fact that we have some integer valued columns and maybe treat them as categorical. So for example, if we look first at the categorical variable, this name, if it has a low value of classes, it can be useful in a graphic. However, it's, it is the case that it has too many classes. I don't know if we want to know the total, I guess it would be something like this. Yeah, 301. I know it's too many to work with uh, the um, be a simple picture for the origin uh, predictor. We know that it is integer. It's an integer, sorry, oh, sorry, as we saw over here. However, it's, no, sorry, over here. However, as we can see in this part, the unique values in that column are simply one, three, and two. So we can work with it also as a categorical, not, so, not only as an integer value. And I think the same have, the same thing happens with this one, the yeah, cylinders. It has only five classes, well, five values. They are integers, or we can work with them also as categorical ones. So first, we can compare the year and the response. So let's do a bar plot of those. Uh, we can see, starting from the year 80, 
most of the observations belong to this uh, class of MPG value as one. That is the MPG value above the medium of the whole MPG column. So it's like, if it's, it may be the case that given the observation, if the year is above 79, well, probably 1,979, 1, then we could say, ah, it is indeed above the medium MPG, right? We don't know, it can be useful maybe. We can do the same thing comparing the origin and the response. Um, in this case of oh, origin value one, also most of them seem to be of the case of the false, the zero value. And now, because we have a bunch of, uh, so because we have a bunch of, uh floating valued columns we can do the same type of scatter plots that we did in the previous exercise so we are going to be performing those scatter plots with those floating valued uh, columns with the x-axis representing the year and the color representing the, the response so let's uh it's probably going to take away I know it's okay. But let's let it finish. I could have I could have done this in a, a Jupyter notebook for, for in order to have the results already uh, saved. Uh, but I you know I don't like Jupyter notebooks. I prefer to do this in this manner. Let's see. Um, over here. So for example, year by year, we plot acceleration and we color depend depending on the response. Uh, we only observe the value that we have we already had uh, seen previously that above the year 79, most of the observations are uh, orange. So we don't really gain much information. Over here, we also already so this one, I think, cylinders. I oh, know, sorry, that was origins. But for over here for cylinders, it seems to be the case that if the value is four for cylinders, that independent of the year, uh, it will probably be a class of one for the response. Over here, there seems to be a threshold of, I don't know, something like 175, that if the displacement is below below 175, then independent of the year, the response is one. And such and such, we can do the same analysis. For example, over here happens something similar. There is a kind of stretch code that almost determines the response value. Similarly over here for weight. In this cases, uh, this is really mostly the same as we saw in the previous graph of origin versus response. Um, yeah, and such and such. But the main idea is that as we saw, uh, some of the floating valued columns, they seem to have a, a certain threshold that determines a response. That, sorry, that almost determines the response. The author also suggests us to do box plots, uh, but really, we get almost similar conclusions, so I will just skip them. Uh, and now, from where for the graphics that we saw, pretty much uh, the ones that I mentioned that there were some threshold, uh, those are the ones that I am going to consider as significant predictors. So I think those were displacement, horsepower, and weight. And now, because that worked also when we work with gear. I am also going to include them. Something happen, something similar happened with cylinder, and of course we need to include the response because it is a column significant for our analysis. Now they ask us to split the data. Uh, well, first we subset. We are going to working. We are going to be working only with some particular cases of predictors. This one's over here. So let me run that. 
okay? This is our, our data now, our significant data. Uh, we do the same old stuff of splitting between training and testing. Uh, we consider uh, a third as of the, the of this data, significant data, let's call it, uh, as, the, as the testing data. So we have split it uh, one, two, three. And now we can start fitting our models. So let's see, it says, perform LDA uh, and, what is, and calculate the test error. Well, that is just almost copy pasting code. So let's fit the model and we get a, a pretty good accuracy. Uh, that's not really uh, completely significant to say that the model is good. Uh, we have to use another, sorry, also another other metrics, something like the, I think it's called for Cohen's Kappa value and such and such. Uh, let's try to run it also for the QDA. We fit the model and what is the result? Uh, it's actually smaller, so QDA was not as good as LDA. Perhaps there is a, a, a model between them that is actually even better. Maybe a regular, regularized version. And then, let's see. They say, ah, perform logistic regression. To calculate the test error. Well, the code has to change, the code has to change a little bit because uh, it's not the same scenario as we saw for, for the example in the lab where they define the indices for the training and then they simply subset. But now we have used this function, right? That it, it outputs two data frames and, and the other are simply like columns of those data frames. I think they are called Panda series. But the main idea is that we have already defined the training data set. But from those, we can extract the index and simply consider the the these indices uh, to treat them in the same fashion as we saw how they perform the train test split in the lab. So trying to emulate that, we see that for the train for the training data set, we still have the indices uh, that they had in the original data, the auto data set. So we retrieve those and kind of copy paste the code that we had for the logistic regression case. But now, instead of using log over here, as they saw in the previous example, we have to use ilog because we are subsetting via indices. Uh, but that's really mostly the only change. We fit the logistic regression model. And then, ah, this part is also different. In the other one, this, this one set down. But now the category is zero or one. So the negative case would be zero. That is like the, the failure, the non-success. We perform the same, but and then we get the uh, accuracy of almost 90%. And, and in this case, it happens to be the, let me check the comment by Ricardo, the precision. Wait, let me check again. Uh, yeah, the precision is quite high compared to what we saw in the previous exercise. Then perform nice bias. Well, it's really almost copy paste. We remove this column that was added as an intercept. And also assume normality for predictors. And we get, I think I'm going to get an error. And it's okay. Uh, I, no. I... And we make a ton of assumptions, like independence of predictors per class, a normality of predictors. And even still in that quite uh, non-flexible case, 
uh, the accuracy is quite high. So again, we have to be mindful that accuracy is not the only metric that we we use for for saying that the model is good or not in classification. Uh, and lastly, we perform KNN using several values of K and comparing the test errors that we have for all of those K, K values. So let's see, uh, as a size of the neighborhood, I'm going to consider from one to 10. I could do more, but I thought that it was going to take a while. It seems to be the case that it's, it's actually fast because the data set is pretty small. So we use a classifier changing by these values, the size of the neighborhoods, and we are going to be storing the accuracy of all of these models. Uh, let's see. Ah, this is the these are the confusion matrices that we get. For example, for only a uh, neighborhood neighborhood size of one, uh, very few uh, errors in our classifications. Still very few, it, and it seems to be the case that once k grows, so we consider more neighbors, the the number of errors seems to increase. Um, maybe not monotonically, but in, as a general tendency, let's call it. So now comparing the the accuracy of those 10 models of KNN, we get that, let's see, which is the greatest one? Well, the first one, it, yeah, it does seem to be monotonically decreasing. Huh. So if we're using one, one neighbor, uh, Maybe it was the best. Probably not because we have we have not done cross validation, so it's we don't have enough information to conclude that. But in this case, it was the best. And now, well, there's only ten minutes. Uh, as I said, this exercise it's really not quite related to the book. It's more Python ish. And the last one, it says, using the Boston dataset, here classification models in order to predict where a given sabor has prime rate above or below the medium. So it seems pretty similar to the last one. Let, let's see if we, well, I have not run it, but just to check something quick, I am not going to do it right now. I only want to look at something. To end the discussion. Let's let's load this data set and check its uh, its values and uh, let's see. Sorry, I'm getting a point. Okay. And it says whether a given software software has a time rate or below or above the medium. Uh, I suppose that this is a time rate, so it really would be the same like Boston. A prime, the median, and comparing right with above, let's say it's above. Uh, and as we saw, simply converting that to uh, zeros and ones. What is zero? So it's the same as the other one, and then. Uh, no, it's it's really the same uh, as the other cases. Uh, as I said, I would have gone over here. So yeah, there's really not much gain in, in showing the codes and the uh, The findings would be the interesting part, but I have not done it. So uh, that would be it for me. Uh, are there any comments or questions? Uh, thank you, Lucio. Uh, just one comment. Uh, when I did the uh, uh, the the exercise, you know, for the auto uh, data set, I also included the the origin. Okay, because uh, you know when I did the the exploratory analysis, one of the things that I noticed is that the American cars are usually below the median compared to the European and Japanese. 
So that could be something that it could help uh, the model. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, I'm, I'm looking for the for the graphic of the origin. Right. Um, yeah, I, I, uh, I did yeah, it with yeah. a box plot. I did it with a box plot and uh, the the origin number one, which is American manufacturer cars, mm -hmm. uh, usually goes below the median. European, which is the number two and Japanese number three, they usually go above the median. Uh, that's pretty interesting. So uh, that could you... be another another predictor that could help. Do you but... have over there the the accuracy that you got for those models or uh yeah. Um I have here for the let's see okay for the LDA, which is the first model, I have an accuracy of uh ninety six point ninety six. Uh, I got to your point nine. Okay. Yeah, so if if you add the origin and also I also added the acceleration too. Okay, those both, but the origin is one that is uh is uh, is significant is significant, I believe. Um you get a higher a higher accuracy and better I'm I'm better uh, and less you know less false positive and false negatives in, in all the models. Uh, so you uh, I think you only ignore the name basically. Correct. Yes. Oh, okay, okay. And the and the MPG. <laughs> ah, of course, of course. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's a giveaway. Right, right. Yeah. I included everything except the name and the MPG. That's right. Uh, interesting. Do, uh, do you know if there is kind of a like a regular regularized version, but kind of like lasso? But for LDA and QDA, not like the ones that we saw last week. Mm, I don't remember for LDA, but I know that for logistic regression, there's a there's a regularized uh, parameters. Okay. Okay. I don't remember for linear, but we can check in the SK uh, Scikit Learn uh, reference. Uh, it will tell you, you know, if it if it if it has or not. Yeah, because it seems interesting because instead of subsetting a bunch of predictors, we could have mm -hmm. used all of them and like last yeah. would take care of, of it to get which are the significant ones. Correct. Correct. In fact, there's a chapter on regularized regression, so we'll uh, yeah. we'll, we'll we'll get there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well lastly, just let me check if there is someone already signed up for the next meeting. Uh, so we have ah uh, yes we have Federica she she joined the last meeting she's going to be covering the resampling.